Hello, my name is Sin Bagley, and I'm reading The Skylark of Space by E.E. E. Doc Smith in collaboration with Lee Hawkins Garvey. Chapter 7 The Trial Journey The great steel forgings which were to form the framework of the Skylark finally arrived and were hauled into the testing shed. There, behind closed doors, Crane inspected every inch of the massive members of the lens, but could find nothing wrong. Still unsatisfied, he filled, fitted up an electrical testing apparatus in order to search out flaws which might be hidden beneath the surface. This device revealed flaws in every piece, and after thoroughly testing each one and mapping out the imperfections, he turned to Seaton with a grave face. Worse than useless, every one of them. They're barely strong enough to stand shipment. They figured that we would go slowly until we were well out of the atmosphere, then put on power, then something would give way and we would never come back. That's about the right dope, I guess. But now what do we do? We can't cancel without letting them know we're on to them, and we certainly can't use this stuff. No, but we will go ahead and build the ship anyway so that they will think that we are going ahead with it, and at the same time we will build another one about four times this size in absolute secrecy. And... What do you mean, absolute secrecy? How can you keep steel casings and forgings of that size secret from steel? I know a chap who owns and operates a small steel plant, so ignis insignificant relatively that he has not yet been brought out, bought out or frozen out by steel. I was able to do him a small favor once, and I am sure that he will be glad to return it. We will not be able to oversee the work, but this is the drawback. We can get McDougal to do it for us, however, and with him doing the work, we can rest assured that there will be nothing off-color. Even Steele couldn't buy him. McDougal, the man who installed the intercontinental plant, he wouldn't touch a little job like this with a pole. I think he would. He and I are rather friendly, and after I tell him all about it, he'll be glad to take it. It means building the first interplanetary vessel, you know. Wouldn't still follow him up if he should go to work on a mysterious project? He's too big to hide. No, he will go camping. He often does. I have gone with him several times when we were completely out of touch with civilization for two months at a time. Now, about the ship we want. Have you any ideas? It will cost more than our entire capital. That is easily arranged. We do not care how much it costs. See, it began to object to drawing so heavily upon the resources of his friend, but was promptly silenced. I told you when we started, Crane said flatly, that your solution and your idea were worth far more than a half a million. In fact, they're warm, worth more than everything I have. No more talk of the money. End of it, Dick. All right, we'll build a regular go-getter. Four times the size, she'll be a bear cat, Mark. I'm glad this one is on the fritz. She'll carry a 200-pound bar. Zowie, watch our smoke. And say, why wouldn't it be a good idea to build an attractor? A thing like an object compass, but mounting a 10-pound bar instead of a needle, so that if they chase us in space, we can reach out and grab them. We might mount a machine gun in each quadrant, shooting explosive bullets through pressure gaskets in the walls. We should have something for defense. I don't like the possibility of having that gang of pirates after us. Nothing to fight back with except thought waves. Right. We will do both those things, but we should make the power plant big enough to avert any possible contingency. Say, 400 pounds? And we should have everything in duplicate from power plant to push buttons. I don't think that's necessary, Mark. Don't you think that's carrying the caution to extremes? Possibly, but I would rather be a live coward than a dead hero, wouldn't you? You chirped it, old scout. I sure would. I never did like the looks of that old guy with a scythe, and I would hate to let Duchesne feel that he had slipped something over on me and my own game. Besides, I've developed a lot of caution myself lately. Double she is with a skin of four-foot Norwegian armor. Let's get busy. They made the necessary alteration in the plans, and in a few days work was begun upon the huge steel shell in the mountain steel plant. The work was done under the constant supervision of the great MacDougall by men who had been in his ploy for years and who were all above suspicion. What was being built, Seaton and Crane developed as force of men and went ahead with the construction of the space car in the testing shed. 
While they did not openly slight the work, nearly all their time was spent in the house perfecting the main, many essential things which were to go into the real Skylark. There was the attractor for which they had to perfect a special sighting apparatus so that it would act in any direction, and yet would not focus upon the ship itself nor anything it contained. There were many other things. It was in this work that the strikingly different temperaments of, and abilities of the two men were most clearly revealed. Seaton strode up and down the room, puffing great volumes of smoke from his hot and reeking briar, suggesting methods and ideas, his keen mind finding the way over or around or through apparently inseparable obstacles which beset their path. Crane, seated calmly at the drafting table, occasionally inhaling a mouthful of smoke from one of his specially made cigarettes, mercilessly tore Seaton's suggestions to shreds pointing out their weaknesses, proving his points with his cold, incisive reasoning, and his slide rule calculations of factors, stresses, and strains. Seaton, in turn, would find a remedy for every defect, and finally the idea, complete and perfect, Crane would impale it upon the point of his drafting pencil and spread it in every detail upon the paper before him, while Seaton's active mind leaped to the next problem. Not being... Not being vitally interested in the thing being built in the shed, they did not know that to the flawed members were being attached faulty plates by imperfect welding. Even if they had been interested, they could not have found the poor workmanship by any ordinary inspection, for it was being done by a picked crew of experts, picked by Perkins. But to make things even, even, Perkins' crew did not know that the peculiar instruments installed by Seton and Crane, of which their foreman took many photographs, were not real instruments and were made only nearly enough like them to pass inspection. They were utterly useless in design and function, far different from the, from the real instruments intended for the Skylark. Finally, the last dummy instrument was installed in the worthless space car, which the friends referred to themselves referred to between themselves as the Cripple, a name which Seaton soon changed to Old Crip. The construction crew was dismissed after Crane had let the foreman overhear a talk between Seaton and himself in which they decided not to start for a few days as they had some final experiments to make. Prescott reported that Steele had relaxed his vigilance and was apparently waiting for the first flight. Upon the same time word was received from McDougall that the real Scarlet was ready for the Finishing touches, a huge triplane descended upon Cranefield and was loaded to its capacity with strange-looking equipment. When it left, Seaton and Crane were, went with it to make the final test before the first flight, leaving a heavy guard over the house in the testing shed. A few nights later, in inking blackness, a huge dis shape descended rapidly in front of the shed, whose ponderous doors opened to receive it, and closed quickly after it. The skylock moved lightly and easily as a wafted feather, betraying its thousands of tons of weight only by the hole it made in the hard beaten earth of the floor as it settled to rest. Opening one of the heavy doors, Seaton and Crane sprang out into the darkness. Dorothy and her father, who had been informed that the skylock was to be brought home that night, were waiting. Seaton caught up his sweetheart in one mighty arm and extended his hand past her to Vainman, who seized it both in his own. Upon the young man's face was the look of a victorious king returning from conquest. For a few minutes, disconnected exclamations were all that any of the party could utter. Then Seaton, loosening slightly his bear's hold upon Dorothy, spoke. She flies, he cries it exultantly. She flies, dares like a ray of light for speed and like a bit of thistle down for lightness we've been around the moon around the moon cried the two amazed visitors so soon asked Feynman when did you start almost an hour ago replied Crane readily he had already taken out his watch his voice was calm and his face was quiet but to those who knew him best a deeper resonance in his voice and a deeper blue sparkle in his eyes betrayed his emotion both the venters were moved more than they could have told by their achievement, by the complete success of the great space cruiser upon which they had labored for months with all the power of their marvelous intellects. Seaton stood now at the summit of his pride, no recognition by the masses, no 
plazas by the multitudes. No praise even from the upper ten of his own profession could equal for him the silent adulation of the two before him. <clears throat> Dorothy's exquisite face was glorified as she looked at her lover. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Her eyes wonderful as they told him how high he stood above all others in her world, how much he loved him. Seeing that look, the sweet face, more beautiful than ever in his, his hour of trumpet, triumph, that perfect, adorable body, Seaton forgot the others, and a, a more profound exultation that brought by his flight filled his being humble thankfulness that he was the man to receive the untold treasure of a great giving. Every bit of mechanism we had occasion to use worked perfectly, Crane stated proudly. We did not find it necessary to change any of our apparatus, and we hope to make a longer flight soon. The hour we took on this flight might easily have been only a few minutes, for the lark did not even begin to pick up speed. The travelers invited their visitors to inspect the new craft. Crane and the older man climbed through the circular doorway, which was at an elevation of several feet above the ground. Seaton and Dorothy exchanged a brief but enthusiastic caress before he lifted her slightly up to the opening and folded, followed her up a short flight of stairs. Although she knew what to expect from her lover's descriptions and from her own knowledge of Old Crip, which she had seen many times, she caught her breath in amazement as she stood up and looked upon the brilliantly lighted interior of the great sky rover. It was a sight such as she had never before seen upon Earth. She saw a spherical shell of hardened steel armor plate fully 40 feet in diameter, though its true shape was not readily apparent from the inside as it was divided into several compartments by horizontal floors or decks. In the exact center of the huge shell was a spherical network of enormous steel beams. Inside this structure could be seen a similar network which, mounted upon universal bearings, was free to revolve in any direction. This inner network was filled with machinery surrounding a shining copper cylinder. From the outer network radiated six mighty supporting columns. These, branching as they neared the hull of the vessel, supported the power plant and steering apparatus in the center and so strengthened the shell that the whole structure was nearly as strong as a solid steel ball. She noticed that the floor, perhaps eight feet above the center, was highly upholstered in leather and did not seem solid, and the same was true of the dozen or more seats, she could not call them chairs, which were built in various places. She gazed with interest at the two instrument boards upon which flashed tiny lights in the highly polished plate glass condensate and metal of many instruments, the use of which she could not guess. After a few minutes of silence, both visitors began to ask questions, and Seaton showed them the personal features of the novel craft. Crane accompanied them in silence, enjoying their pleasure, glorying in the mighty vessel. Seaton called attention to the great size and strength of the lateral supporting columns, one of which was immediately above their heads, and then led over to the vertical columns, which pierced the middle of the floor. Enormous as the lateral had seemed, it appeared puny in comparison with this monster of fabricated steel. Seaton explained that the two verticals were many times stronger than the four laterals, as the center of gravity of the ship had been made lower than its geometrical center, so that the apparent motion of the vessel, and therefore the power of the bar, would usually be merely vertical. Resting one hand crescently upon the huge column, he exultantly explained that these numbers were the last word in strength made up of many separate eye beams and angles of the strongest known special steel latticed and braced until no conceivable force could make them yield a millimeter. But why such strength? said the lawyer doubtfully. The column alone would hold up Brooklyn Bridge. To hold down the power plant so the bar won't tear through the ship when we cut her loose, replied Seaton. Have you any idea how fast this bird can fly? Well, I have heard you speak of traveling with the velocity, velocity of light, but this, that is overdrawn, isn't it? Not very much. Our figures show that with a 400-pound bar, 
pointing to the copper cylinder in the exact center of the inner sphere, we could develop not only the velocity of light, but an acceleration equal to that velocity, were it not for the increase in mass at high velocities as shown by Einstein and others. We can't go very fast near the Earth, of course, as the friction of the air would melt the whole works in a few minutes. Until we get out of the atmosphere, our speed will be limited by the ability of steel to withstand melting by the friction of the air to somewhere in the neighborhood of four or 5,000 miles per hour. But out in space, we can develop any speed we wish up to that of light as a limit. I studied physics a little in my youth. Wouldn't the mere force of such an acceleration as you mentioned flatten you on the floor and hold you there? And any sudden jar would certainly kill you. There can't be any sudden jar. This is a special floor, you notice. It is mounted on a long, extremely heavy springs to take any possible jar. Also, whenever we are putting on power, we won't try to stand up. Our legs would, would crimple up like strings. We'll ride securely strapped into the special seats, which are mounted the same as the floor, only a whole lot more so. As for the acceleration, the word means picking up speed, doesn't it? Interrupted Dorothy. The rate of picking up speed, corrected Seaton. That is, if you were going 40 miles per hour one minute and 50 the next minute, your acceleration would be 10 miles per hour per minute. See? It's acceleration that makes you feel funny when you start up or down in an elevator. Then riding in this would be like starting up an, in an elevator so that your heart sinks into your boots and you can't breathe. Yes, only worse. We'll pick up speed faster and keep on doing it. Seriously, interrupted the lawyer, do you think that the human body can stand any such acceleration as that? I don't know. We're going to find out by starting out slowly and increasing our acceleration to as much as we can stand. I see, Vainman said. But how are you going to steer her? How are you keeping permanent reference points such as there are no direction in space? That was our hardest problem, explained Seaton. But Barton solved it perfectly. See the power plant up there? Notice those big supporting rings and bearings? Well, the power plant is entirely separate from the ship as it is inside the inner sphere, about which the outer sphere and the ship itself are free to revolve in any direction. No matter how much the ship rolls and pitches as she is bound to do, every time we come near enough to any star or planet to be influenced by its gravitation, the bar stays where it is pointed. Those six big jackets in the outer sphere on the six sides of the bar cover the six pairs of gyroscope wheels, weighing several tons each, turning at a terrific speed in a vacuum. The gyroscopes keep the whole outer sphere in exactly the same position as long as they keep turning, and afford us not only permanent planes of reference, but also a solid foundation in those planes which can be used in pointing the bar. The bar can be turned instantly to any direction, whether by special electrical instruments on the boards, you see the outer sphere stays immovably fixed in that position with the bar of liberty, to turn in any direction inside it. Oh, with the bar at liberty to turn in any direction inside it. And the ship at liberty to do the same thing outside it. Now we'll show you where we sleep, Satan continued. We have eight rooms, four below and four above, leading the way to a narrow, steep, steel stairway and down into a very narrow hall, from either side of which two doors open. This is my room. The journey one is Mars. Shiro sleeps across the hall. The rest of the rooms are for our guests on future trips. Sliding back the door, he switched on the light and revealed a small but fully appointed bedroom, completely furnished with everything necessary, yet everything condensed into the least possible space. The floor, like the one above, was of cushioned leather supported by springs. The bed was modification of the special seats I'll refer to. Opening another sliding door, he showed them an equally complete and equally compact bedroom. You see, we have all the comforts of home. This bathroom, however, is practical only when we have some force downward, either gravitation or our own acceleration. The same reasoning counts for the handrails you see everywhere on board. Drifting in space, you know, there's no weight, and you can't walk. You must pull yourself around. If you tried to take a step, you would bounce up and hit the ceiling and stay there. That is why the ceilings are so well padded. And if you tried to wash your face, you wouldn't throw water all over the place, and it would float around in the air instead of falling to the floor. As long as we can walk, we can use the bathroom. If I should want to wash my face while we are drifting, I just press this button here and the pilot will put on enough acceleration to make the correct use of water possible. There are a lot of surprising things about the trip into space. 
I don't doubt it a bit. I'm simply wild to go for a ride with you. Will you take me, Dickie? Dorothy asked eagerly. Very soon, Dottie. As soon as we get her in perfect running condition, you shall be the first to ride with us, I promise you. Where do you cook and eat? How do you see out? How about the air and water supply? How do you keep warm or cool, as the case may be? Asked the girl's father, as though he were cross-examining a witness. Shiro has a gallery on the main floor, and tables fold up into the wall of the main compartment. The passengers see out by sliding back steel panels, which normally cover the windows. The pilot can see in any direction from his seat at the instrument board by means of special instruments and something like periscopes. The windows are made of optical glass, similar to that used in the largest telescopes. They are nearly as thick as the hull and have a comprehensive resistance, almost equal to that of armor steel. Although so, so thick, they are crystal clear, and a speck of dust on the outer surface is easily seen. We have water enough in tanks to last us three months, or indefinitely if we should have to be careful, as we can automatically distill and purify our own wastewater, recovering absolutely pure H2O. We have compressed air also in tanks, but we need very little as the air is constantly being purified. Also, we have oxygen generating apparatus aboard in case we should run short. As to keeping warm, we have electric heating coils run by the practically inexhaustible power of a small metal bar. If we get too near the sun and get too warm, we have a refrigerating machine to cool us off. Anything else? You better give up, Dad, laughingly advised his daughter. You've thought of everything, haven't you, Dick? Well, Mark has, I think. This is all his doing, you know. I, ha I wouldn't have thought of tenth of it myself. I must remind you, young folks, said the old man, glancing at his watch, that it's very late and high time for Dottie and me to be going home. We would like to stay and see the rest of it, but do you know we must be away from here before daylight? As they went into the house, Feynman asked, What does the other side of the moon look like? I've always been curious about it. We were not able to see much, replied Crane. It was too dark and we did not take the time to explore it, but from what we could see by means of our searchlights, it is very much like this side, the most barren and desolate place imaginable. After we go to Mars, we intend to explore the moon thoroughly. Mars, then, is your first goal? When do you tend to start? We haven't decided definitely, probably in a day or two. Everything is ready now. As the Vaymans had come out into the streetcar in order to attract as little attention as possible, Seaton volunteered to take them home in one of Crane's cars. As they bade Crane good night, after enjoying Cheryl's suitable refreshment, the lawyer took the chauffeur's seat, motioning his daughter and Seaton into the closed body of the car. As soon as they had started, Dorothy turned to the embrace of her lover's arm. Dick, she said fiercely. I would have been worried sick if I would known that you were way off there. I knew it, sweetheart. That's why I didn't tell you we were going. We both knew the Skylark was perfectly safe, but I knew that you would worry about our first trip. Now that we have been to the moon, we won't be uneasy when we go to Mars. Will you, dear? I can't help it, boy. I will be afraid that something terrible has happened every minute. Won't you take me with you? Then if anything happens, it will happen to both of us, and that is as it should be. You know that I wouldn't want to keep on living if anything should happen to you. He put both his arms round her as his reply and pressed his cheek on hers. Dorothy, sweetheart, I know exactly how you feel. I feel the same way myself. I'm awfully sorry, dear, but I can't do it. I know the machine is safe, but I've got to prove it to everybody else before I take you on a long trip with me. Your father will agree with me that you ought not to go on the first trip or two anyway. And besides, what would Madam Grundy say? Well, there is a way, she began, and he felt her face turned hot. His arms turned tight around her, and his, her breath came fast. I know it, sweetheart. I would like nothing better in the world than to be married today and take our honeymoon in the Skylark, but I can't do it. After we come back from the first long trip, we will be married just as soon as you say ready, and after that we'll always be together wherever I go, but I can't take you even the millionth part of a chance with anything as valuable as you are. You see that, don't you, Dottie? I suppose so, she turned his consult. <sighs> but you'll make it a short trip for my sake. I know I won't rest a minute until you get back. I promise you that we won't be gone more than four days. Then for the greatest honeymoon that ever was, and they clung together in the dark body of the scar, 
each busy with solemn and beautiful thoughts of the happiness to come. They soon reached their destination, and as they entered the house, Dorothy made one more attempt. Dad, Dick is just too perfectly mean. He says he won't take me on the first trip. If you were going out there, would Mother want to go along with you? After listening to Seton give his decision, Dick is right, kitten. He must make the long trip first, Then, after the machine has proved reliable, you may go with him. I can think of no better way of spending a honeymoon. It will be a new one, at least. But you wouldn't worry about the boys getting back safely. I might not trust either of them alone, but together they are invincible. Good night, children. I wish you success, Dick, as he turned away. Seton took a lover's leave of Dorothy and went into the lawyer's study, taking an envelope from his pocket. Mr. Vayman, he said in a low voice, I think the steel crowd is still camping on our trail. We're ready for them with a lot of stuff that they've never heard of, but in case anything goes wrong, Martin has written between the lines of this legal form in invisible ink, A36, exactly how to get the position of all our notes and plans so that the company can go ahead with everything. With those directions, any chemist can find and use the stuff safely. Please put this in an envelope in the safest place you can think of, and then forget it unless you get both crane unless they get both Crane and me. There's about one chance in a million of their doing that, but Mart doesn't gamble on even that chance. He is right, Dick. I believe that you can outwit them in any situation, but I will keep this paper where that no one except myself can ever see it. Nevertheless, good night, son, and good luck. The same to you, sir, and thank you. Good night. And that is the end of Chapter 7.